Welcome to Bite Size Bible Study. I'm Pastor Nathan. In today's study, we are going to take a look at one story with two healings in it. And looking at this passage, we are going to ask some questions of our author, explore three big ideas, and see where the conclusion leads us in living out our faith in today's world. I don't think it's too much to expect that our view of these three big words in today's lesson might shift our understanding of what it means to live in God's kingdom in the here and now. So grab your Bible, get a notepad, make a fresh cup of tea, and let's dig into this edition of Bite Size Bible Study as we read Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 through 26. Let's hear these words. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hands on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, for she said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house, and saw the flute players in the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. Join me in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you today, praising you for what you have done in our lives, praising you for this story of healing that testifies to your miracle-working, resurrecting power. Lord, we would ask that we would experience your presence in this time as we dig into your word. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I want to start out with an apology to you. I, I don't usually do this, but I feel like I owe you one today. I use the New Revised Standard Version translation for all of my bite-sized Bible studies to keep it consistent. Sometimes this is a great translation into English of what's going on, and other times it buries some terrific details, or even the main point. Today's passage falls on the buried side, no pun intended. There are some great details in this passage completely omitted from the English in this translation. These details add up to an amazing point that Matthew is trying to make that is also relevant for us in today's world. We see these two healings in this passage, and it looks a little bit disjointed, perhaps. Understanding the full scope of this passage, most scholars believe, presupposes having read and known the same story in Mark. I will be cross-referencing some of Mark's story throughout this one so that we can see exactly the points Matthew wanted to sharpen or newly make out of this story. Let's turn our attention now to these verses. In verse 18, we see at the beginning of this passage that it picks up where we left off last time. Jesus had just finished telling his disciples about the wine and the wineskins in the previous verse, and Matthew envisages Jesus being interrupted in the telling of this parable by a distraught father. In Mark, and I warned you that we were going to do this, this passage takes place as Jesus steps off of a boat in Capernaum. In Matthew, he is reclined at table with his disciples, teaching the disciples of John about the nature of the kingdom of God. This is important because for Matthew, this healing passage fits within that context, the context of a story about the kingdom of God. Who is the man who approaches Jesus? Well, in Mark, the man is a leader of the synagogue named Jairus. The NRSV I read from maintains that tradition, but in the Greek of Matthew, there is only one word used to describe this man, and that word is archon. Archon simply means leader. It could be that this man was a leader of the synagogue. It could also mean that he was the mayor or some similar title. He could have been a respected businessman. He could have been anything that you consider a leader. Maybe a political leader, maybe a religious leader, maybe an economic leader, if they thought in those terms. Why would Matthew change Mark's story so much from a leader of the synagogue to simply a leader? And does that change, change the story? Well, the answer to both of those questions is that he likely changed it for the sake of his original audience. 
Remember, Matthew's community has just left or been kicked out of their local synagogue. So to lift up a synagogue leader as one who Jesus heals might not have evoked much sympathy in them. They would not be able to identify with this man if he was an unsympathetic figure in their eyes, and that's important for what comes later. Matthew wants to make a point about this man, and he can't make that point if he is identified the way Mark identifies him. The second reason for this change centers on the fact that Matthew wants to echo the story about the centurion asking for healing of his servant from chapter 8. In both cases, a leader, a respected community member, approaches Jesus to ask for healing of someone in their household. In that story, the centurion tells Jesus to only say a word and the servant will be healed. Here in this passage, the Greek says the archon tells Jesus, only come and touch her and she will live. A word will heal. A touch will resurrect. It's a powerful theological statement that Matthew wants to make. In case you are missing it through all of these details, here it is. A little bit of faith and only one word or one touch from Jesus can save. We will hear that word save again in a little bit, and later we will see why this really matters for us. The three big words for today are faith, touch, save. And here we can see them at play in the very first verse. Now, verse 19, notably, Jesus gets up. We know this will be because he was reclining at the religious feast in the previous passage. However, the word for get up in Greek used here is the same word that will be used at the end of this passage for what the little girl does when Jesus brings her back to life. It is a mirroring in Greek, a foreshadowing that as this little girl will be resurrected, so too will Jesus. Jesus' disciples follow him because, well... They must follow him to know what he does. Verse 20. In the Greek, Matthew's favorite phrase, edu, is found here. I haven't pointed out many instances of it throughout the book so far. There's a lot of them. I just haven't made mention of it. Because most of them are just not translated. However, here we can see it in English translated as, then suddenly. Matthew often uses the word edu, which actually means behold, to mark a significant passage that he wants his readers to pay attention to. So this story inserted into the main healing narrative must be important for us. This woman has been having menstrual bleeding, that's what the Greek word means, for 12 years. Was it really 12 years or did Matthew just want to elicit sympathy or was the number 12 significant to Matthew? Yes, it was significant, but is that why he used it here? We don't know. But in the Hebrew scriptures, this sort of bleeding would make a woman unclean, and she would be prohibited from, you guessed it, touching anyone, or they too would be made unclean. We can see then that this story about this woman is going to actually be about touch, faith, and save. This is why both Mark and Matthew, as well as Luke, have these two stories laid out the same way. These stories go together, and historically it may have made sense. That the woman basically sneaks up behind Jesus in order to touch him when it's just Jesus and his five disciples walking along the road is probably a leftover editorial oversight from Mark's gospel, where the woman had to sneak through a crowd to touch Jesus. Unlike in Mark, this version of Jesus doesn't have power go out from him, but rather he turns to the woman. He knows what's in her heart, and he responds to her in sympathy. Why? Because... For Matthew, Jesus is really the one in control of the situation, even if the woman thinks she is. Much has been made by pastors over the years of this woman only touching the fringe. In Greek, it actually means something more like a tassel of Jesus' cloak. If it was a tassel, the pastors would say, then it would mean that she didn't actually touch his cloak but something attached to his cloak with the expectation that even this tiny touch removed by several degrees from Jesus' person would make her well. Literally in Greek, the word that is translated in this passage to be made well is the word sozos, which means save. That's why I've been saying that's one of our words. Every time we hear the words made well in this passage, it actually means healed or saved. Sozos is also where we get the English word salvation and a bigger theological word soteriology from. 
So this woman would be sozo, receive sozos, by touching the fringe of Jesus' garment, his tassel. Verse 21. We see in this verse, Jesus can read her inner thoughts. Unlike in the other Gospels, there is not a conversation or exchange that happens. The woman's needs are not verbalized out loud for others to hear and so embarrass her. The dialogue about her bleeding isn't mentioned because perhaps if Jesus is actually going to the house of a devout Jew, then her touching him would make him unclean. And thus his ability to render aid would be made a moot point because he would be unable to touch her. So Jesus reads her mind. We've seen this before and we will see it again. Jesus knows what she is thinking. She wants to be healed, one meaning of sozos. But what Jesus is more interested in, as we will see with the little girl, and we just saw not too long ago with the paralytic, what Jesus is more interested in is in saving her. So he takes her desire for a touch of his cloak as faith and will save her. In verse 22, we see Jesus turning, knowing someone touched the most outer piece of his garment, probably lightly, if the other Gospels should be considered here. When he looks at her, he doesn't look at her as in Mark with some measure of power missing and a little exasperation or with a question, who touched me? No, Jesus in Matthew already knows everything and his power is limitless. Matthew's Jesus would never accuse someone who wants to be saved through faith. Instead, Jesus says, take heart, daughter which in the Greek is remarkably similar to what we have already heard Jesus say to the paralytic, which is, take heart, son. And that passage in Matthew, he goes on to say, your sins are forgiven. But in this passage, he goes on to say, your faith has saved you. Isn't it interesting that Matthew has chosen words in Greek that parallel each other and link up like that? That's on purpose. He obviously chose to do that. Jesus is the one who forgives sins and saves. In fact, as we saw with the paralytic, they're the same thing. Immediately upon Jesus' words, the woman was healed. Again, we see Jesus as all-powerful and his power acts instantly. His word is immediately accomplished. His word and his action are the same thing. It wasn't the woman's faith alone that healed and saved her. No, it was her faith and only a word from Jesus that saved her. Later, it will be only a touch from Jesus that raises this young girl. Verse 23. This verse is full of imagery. The three points that I want to make, though, go like this. First, the imagery is of a Jewish funeral that has already begun. The archon's wife has likely arranged this whole thing while he was gone, which leads to the second point. The archon's wife said, you know, she's dead. Let's get right to it without her father being here for the funeral. The father had such faith that Jesus could heal her. He didn't stick around for the funeral proceedings, but the wife clearly had no faith that she would be saved. The third point is that we know this is a funeral because in the Greek, it doesn't say flute players. No, flute players are what you have at a party. It says clarinet players which we know from surviving Jewish texts of the time, are expected to be hired for every Jewish funeral. In fact, even the poorest Jews, some texts say, should hire at least two clarinet players. There would have been several clarinet players in any town on call for times such as these in the city, and and they have already arrived here. So what Jesus has actually shown up to is a funeral with the girl's father. And so that puts what he says next into context. Verse 24, Jesus tells the crowd in this verse to go away because she is not dead, but only sleeping. Yeah, right, they think she's definitely dead. In fact, in Greek, it's pretty clear the girl is dead. The funeral has already started. They've checked. She's gone. She's expired. She's passed on. This is not a coma. This isn't some disease that paralyzed her. She is dead, dead. Yet Jesus knows what's coming. So this period of her being in the state will appear like sleep to everyone, including her, when it's all over with. This isn't a comment explicitly on what it means to be dead, as some suggest, that the first death is simply soul sleep. That's just too much weight to put on these words here. Rather, this is actually an attempt by Matthew to insert some textual humor even at the sake of the crowd laughing at Jesus. Why would they laugh? Because what he said is so ludicrous 
Yes, but this is also the same town that has seen all of Jesus' miracles so far. So why would they laugh? Well, they laugh because Matthew is moving towards Capernaum rejecting Jesus, like everyone will reject Jesus. Verse 25. The father obviously gets the crowd under control and out of the house. Notice the clarinet players and the mourners were likely inside the house already when Jesus got there. And notice now that Jesus approaches the little girl. And Mark, he says the Aramaic Talitha kum, which means basically what is written here in Matthew about the outcome. Little girl, get up. Jesus takes her by the hand or literally touches her in Greek. And she gets up like Jesus did earlier in the passage. The Greek word for get up is the same word that will get translated as resurrection later. This little girl was resurrected. The father's faith, Jesus' touch, her life saved. Verse 26. Unlike in Mark, where this concludes with Jesus ordering those gathered to tell no one, we hear that this story spread throughout the district, or in Greek, literally throughout the land. The land envisaged is the area of Capernaum and its surroundings. All right, so what does all this mean for us? Well, there are a few points Matthew makes that I don't just want to gloss over. The bleeding woman is a societal outcast, not quite as bad as the lepers, but not able to experience contact or touch with others. Do you relate to that at all in these days? I do. The little girl who died, the scientific and religious community of the day claimed one thing, but the father believed and Jesus proved that he was bigger than even the grave. Do you need that word today? I do. We have seen over and over again in Matthew's gospel that Jesus responds to true and genuine faith. I skipped this, but in the first verse, it says that the archon knelt before Jesus. Now, we've seen this word in Greek before. It's proskuneo, which means prostrate or to be in a worshipful position. The man's faith was real. It was genuine faith. We also see that those who are most in need are those whom Jesus has touched. A leper, a paralytic, a woman bleeding for 12 years, a dead girl. All of these are in severe need. Matthew muted the religious overtones of this leader because it undercuts the neediness of the girl in Matthew's community's mind. That the disciples witness all of this and are later told to do what they have seen Jesus do is a powerful statement. We, as Jesus' disciples, are called to touch, to heal, to save others who are most in need. Our ministry, our discipleship emphasis should not be upon those who consider themselves to be religiously pure, Matthew would point out, who consider themselves to be socially upstanding, he would say, who consider themselves to have it all together, he might add. Our mission, our ministry, our sending is, in some of the words of Trace Hawthorne, to reach across those barriers that discourage us from touching those at the margins, those deemed ritually unclean, and those for whom society has no hope. Our calling, our ministry, is to assert the love, healing, and salvation of Jesus Christ and our faith. We need to understand that touch can heal. Touch can save. In these times when we can't touch or hug or greet, I think this message hits home. I think that's the word for us today when this touch is missed so dearly. And I think that's the word for us when this is all over and it's safe to touch again. This doesn't mean touch without regard. It means when this is over, we have to understand the power of touch. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you today. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, which touches our hearts and unites us together. We thank you for your word found in Matthew's gospel. We thank you for our calling. And we ask that you would empower us to live into it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining me for another bite-sized Bible study. I'll see you next time.